All right, everybody. Welcome back to the Feeling Your Passion podcast. I know we've been kind of radio silent for a while. It's been a crazy month of travel and, and everything in between. Um, before we get into things of our guest, I want to say a couple of weeks ago, we lost an absolute legend of motorsports. Um, Ken Block passed away in a snowmobile accident, which... Uh, I don't think any of us expected. Nobody expected him to, uh, A, pass away, and B, go in that fashion. Um, but this man left a legacy that, I mean, it's never going to be forgotten, and there's going to be new generations to follow in his footsteps, and current generations, in- including myself, who have taken a lot from him over the years. Um, we're super thankful that we had the time we did with him at, with 509. It was awesome that he supported us, and, and we supported him in return, but... Yeah, hard to believe that one happened, but um, we're thinking of everybody in the whole Block family and network and the sledding community as well. I mean, it, this affected every single realm of action sports. It was absolutely crazy to see some of the posts from A-list celebrities to downhill skiers. Everybody in between um, felt like a, a household name. So rest in peace, Ken Block, and back to our uh, podcast now. All right. Today we have 509 International Sales Manager, Ty Hennessy. Outside of work, Ty is one of my best homies. Um, not sane. I can't even say that. I don't want to be like, <laughs> I helped get you in at the job, but we kept it under wraps is the craziest part. Yeah. So that's why I'm confident in saying <laughs> that I didn't help you with that. We were like, kind of like two buddies, like, do you think you can get the job? I think you can. Yeah, that was, uh, we were like, scheming the system. <laughs> For sure. But Ty, you and I are another one of the Midwest takeovers here at 509. For real. It's born, a movement. Born and raised in Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Yeah. Yes, and, indeed. And then uh, headed west and haven't looked back, right? Yeah. I still struggle when people tell me, oh, I'm never leaving the Midwest. <laughs> like, I'm never going back. No. Outside of family, that's about the only thing that yeah. really brings you back. Dude, I, I go back for like Christmas or whatever, Thanksgiving, and like I said, love my family, but <laughs> like more than 48 hours in the Midwest, I'm going nuts. Yeah, I mean, there's a reason that we drink a lot of beer in the Midwest. <laughs> and ice fish, and <laughs> there's nothing, I we're going to offend so many people from the Midwest, but it's okay, we're both from there too. Yeah, but for those of you that haven't been, it's some of the best people you'll ever meet in your entire life. Yeah. It's just flat. Yeah. You can watch your dog run away for days. Mm -hmm. That's it. It's one of my go-to lines. I know it is. It's a good one. (laughs) (laughs) It's a good one. It's cool though out here. I I love this North Idaho area. I don't want to like tell people to come out here because I'm slowly feel like I'm becoming one of those locals that doesn't want people to come, but it is the most, I've traveled everywhere in the West and the most kind of Midwest people feel with mountains though. Totally. So you're becoming one of the crotchety locals. (laughs) Locals. <laughs> Is that what they call it? Yeah. The, the stay out of my spot that you moved to. <laughs> <laughs> I hate being that guy. Yeah. Um, what I really want to talk to you about today is I have watched you run into trees, get stuck in tree wells, be in creek bottoms, all of this stuff. Never that bent an A-arm, though. Impressive. Claim to fame. Baptism by fire here. Uh, how you started at 509 without having really any sledding background but a moto background Mm -hmm. and i know i'm not calling you old or myself although i am 30 now you're pretty much (laughs) i'm really curious and we'll just dive further into this as this evolves on getting into snowmobiling at a quote-unquote later point in life i mean yeah we're young in the grand scheme of things still but a lot of people have been doing it since they're 5, 10, 15, et cetera. And you really kind of got in when you were 25-ish probably. Yeah. And what that transition was like, because you're going out with people that are, you know, been riding for 10, 15 years. Yeah, yeah it was, uh, I mean, A, like you just kind of got to like put the ego aside. Like any ounce of skill I had on a dirt bike didn't translate aside from the fact that I can endure suffering for maybe a bit longer than just like the average folk. Um, but coming into it, it was just, I needed something to do in the winter because I couldn't ride my dirt bike and I grew up playing hockey. So that took all of my, you know, weekends right. in the winter. 
And then as soon as kind of real life hits and you're not playing sports all the time and whatever else, it was like, shoot, I need something to do. Yeah. And if it's two stroke and it's burning oil and I love it. I, I love that the, the moto side didn't translate and I witnessed <laughs> that firsthand. So Spencer Wilton, um, top 10 enduro rider, like phenomenal rider. I took him out with C boys and Jane Blaine last week, snow biking one day and snowmobiling the other day. He figured out the snow bike. I mean, he's still struggling, but snowmobiling, he walked out of there with like so much respect for sliders, which is funny because he does one move on a rock that I can't even fathom on a dirt bike. But then I stuck him on a sled and he was, hey, he was kind of dog shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, he is definitely a magician on a dirt bike. I mean, yeah, it, it doesn't translate though. It's like everything you think you should do is the wrong thing to do on a snowmobile. Yeah. And so you just got to like pretty much throw everything away and just start reconditioning yourself. And that was a rude awakening yeah. right away. What was the biggest learning curve trying to figure it out at this point? You know, you're not <laughs> turning right to go left. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would say either like just like the counter steering and getting that in your head. Like when you're going through trees and you got to steer towards the tree you want to miss to go right around right. it. Little things like that were just so not first nature. Yeah. That like that one right there was just a, I think one of the more difficult things. And then also just the fitness side of it. Yeah. I mean, as soon as you jump off that sled and you're up to your waist, like, man, you're huffing and puffing, burning thousands of calories, <laughs> ready to ship out in a casket at the end of the day. <laughs> it's funny because I have the opposite perspective of going from sledding my whole life to moto. And I, I don't know, there's some, I think there's more crossover doing that in reverse as far as like balance goes and, and uh, at least specifically like hard enduro stuff yeah. and looking for lines and, you know, looking ahead, not don't look at the tree because you hit the tree. Same concept on a, on a bike. Yeah. Um, it was on a sled, but I, I, I see more guys trying to do the reversal of that and struggling way more than doing sled to bike, but going from bike to sled. Yeah, dude. All like the burned memory in my head was so like to start, I had actually reached out to you and was like, do I get like a 2015 axis or 2016 axis or do I get, you know, a new one from the dealer? And you're like, dude, just go new. You don't know how thrash they'll be. So I dump all this money into it. And I'm just like, hell yeah, let's go ride. <laughs> and I come in with some buddies. We weren't riding on that first one, but um, some other buddies that are very proficient on sleds. And we just drop into this like meadow that just kind of descends down just a hair. And I'm like coming to the bottom like sick. I'm like looking up. I cannot turn around and I have <laughs> no clue how to get this thing going. And I like just kept like 10 more feet down, yeah. 10 more feet down until I was like in the danger zone of like, I shouldn't be there. Yeah. And that was like, I was in one little meadow, one little spot for three and a half hours trying to figure it out until this one guy that comes, who's half my size. just Yeah. That's like exactly what it. You had almost an identical scenario to what Spencer had last week. Was I asked Ben Roth? I'm like, Ben, what do you think Spencer's thinking about this snow bike right now? And he goes, Well, I'm noticing he's really good at going down everything, but I don't think he realizes he has to go back up it. <laughs> <laughs> and it is easy to start funneling down, but I don't know. It's it's interesting. I can't imagine because when I started so young that it just kind of slowly became muscle memory and it hadn't evolved into what it is today. I was kind of there through the evolution. So you got to watch Barant figure out like the first hop over. You got to watch these schooled videos, like tech tip videos, but without growing up with that and then just being thrown into it and trying to learn, I'm just trying to figure out kind of some do's and don'ts for somebody that's, that's getting into the sport without being, because intimidation is number one thing yeah, and avoiding that. Well, I think first and foremost, like just so everyone knows, I'm going to talk about how hard it is to learn, but I'm also having some of the most fun I've ever had on a machine outside of like the one sport I've done for my entire life, which is dirt bikes. So like the whole time I'm struggling, but like loving it at the same time. So 
by no means am I ever going to say it's too hard for anyone to learn. It's just making sure you set the expectation that yeah. the first couple times are going to be difficult. It's what I like to call type two fun. <laughs> which I think <laughs> so you and Ross talking about that. Yeah, you hate it at the time, but you look back on it, it was a blast. Yeah. 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 Like a roller coaster's type one. It's just, it's fun in the moment. <laughs> it's, you know, fun when you look back on it. Type two is, you know, you might not have the most fun in that moment on those first couple of rides, but you're going to remember those very fondly for the rest of your life. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I remember my first few rides out West with like, Mine was Barant coming straight from Minnesota. I was like, oh, here we go. All right, let's try to figure this out. But I see so many guys, <clears throat> you haven't really done it, get frustrated. And I think that comes with age also. Like when you're young and dumb and you're all flexible and, you know, you're not worried about getting hurt, you don't really get mad as much. Yeah. But you get to, and it might be like combination of like, having an ego going into it thinking I can do this and then you're riding with a crew that's way better and these guys get pissed and they're like day 10 on a sled and I'm like that's first thing I'm like don't get angry like this is like at least four seasons till you're it's, I'd say like oh, yeah. very comfortable in a lot of different scenarios or at least definitely comfortable yeah yeah I mean shoot as soon as you get frustrated though I mean if you think about it it's like heart rates up yeah. you're pumped up at that point you're burning way more calories than you should your max effort you know nothing good comes from it like rarely have i ever seen anything good come from frustration yeah so if you can manage that part of it which is fully in my control you know so like all right i can't turn around i suck at riding this thing you know but i can choose not to get frustrated so that's that's an easy one to kind of keep in your back pocket but the other is like especially if you're surrounding yourself with some fun dudes, fun gals to ride with. It's, you know, like, who cares? They don't care. Yeah. I've never met a really judgmental snowmobiler, which is awesome. They can shred. Like, I've, I've gotten the privilege to ride with dudes like him and some others that, you know, actually make a living doing it. And, like, I'm not, I haven't seen a single person, like, yeah. give me anything negative around my skill level or my progression anything they just pump you up and try to coach you and teach you yeah which is a cool part of this industry i think this is going to evolve into like a few different steps here because i'm thinking now step two okay. is <clears throat> i i see guys also go out I, I deal with people in the office and uh people that are new to riding and say hey let's go out we'll work on fundamentals and their first thought is i don't want to slow you guys down and ruin your day yeah. And I'm, I'm, it, then they still like, don't believe you. I'm like, no, I genuinely, the fact that you're showing interest in the sport stokes me out and I want to go help you and we can, you know, do the tamest day you want, whatever, as long as you're out there like learning some stuff. But then the catch 22 of that is if people do think that you just got shitty friends and like find a new group to ride with. Cause <laughs> <laughs> I haven't met many people like that, but there are those groups that just want to go like balls of the walls gnarly all day and just like if you're not if you can't hang you can't come yeah and i think take somebody's word who says they're willing to teach you like yeah they'll be honest if they don't want you to come with we've had days where there's been guys where we do have a mission there's four or five of us we're going to go into some nasty drainage and just being transparent like hey i think not that we don't want you to come i think you could maybe get injured in this scenario just because of experience level. Yeah, which would be the right thing to tell somebody. Like, if you're a good buddy, yeah, you're telling them that because you don't want them to hate the sport you love because you dragged them into something they shouldn't have been in. But I would say, like, I mean, for sure, like a, a prime example is Toby. Mm -hmm. that, you know, 16-year-old Shout out kid. to Toby. Shout He's out to Toby. Uh, but even him, like, we went riding with him not too long ago, you know, and he's – was like able to go ride with Scott Iyer, one of our pro athletes, yeah. and just some other local, I mean, exceptional riders. But it's like he came from Alaska, kind of fresh into the mountain scene, and all of a sudden getting to ride with some like yeah. top tier talent. You and know, he's and, sixteen. Yeah, I mean, and that was the thing is like they told him they'd bring him and show him the ropes, yeah. and they did. And you know, that was the thing. You Trust can see the him. improvement in his riding oh, from totally. the beginning of the year to now. Totally, but yeah, I. The other thing is finding those groups too. 
Yeah. That's the part that's kind of uh, unknown to me just because, I mean, this has been my life, right? Is I do see it. Um, actually, good example, Michael, uh, Ashley's husband, who she runs our X lab here at 509. Um, they relocated from Minnesota and we have a local Facebook page for snow conditions and snowmobiling. And he reached out on there, just was honest, like, hey, I'm new to the area. I don't have anybody to ride with. Uh, obviously, he rides with us occasionally, but he's trying to expand that group. And that would be tough, especially not knowing the group skill set. They don't know yours. You're, I, I can see where that could be, like, nerve-wracking going into it. Like, are they going to be judgmental, and they're not going to want to invite me back? Like, That's a tough Buried to entry into this sport as well. Totally. I think, all right. I'm really? Making, un, I'm really. <laughs> yeah, we're making another. Uh, so we have one. What was one? Uh, one was. Uh, Don't get frustrated. That combined with motocross transfer into sledding. Okay. And then two was. We just talked about it. Uh, it's the end of the day, dude. Fundamentals, having a good group. Uh <laughs> <laughs> You guys are just listening. I, I'm not sure what we just talked about, but now three is. Three is don't be afraid to reach out on forums and other groups, but be honest about your experience. Yeah. I think that's a big one because if you do get yourself into a group that they think you've ridden and you haven't, that can be unfortunate for all parties. But if you're truthful outright, and everyone knows that, and you know their skill level, they're telling you yours, or you're telling you, geez, you're telling them yours. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. It's been a long day. Um, at that point, you know, like all the expectations are there yeah. to make for a great day. Yeah. So I would say that that's definitely another rule is be honest about your skill level and reach out. Don't be afraid to do that. The rare collection which I've seen here uh, in the office. So we have some guys in design that are novice riders trying to figure it out is a group of novice riders all learning together. <laughs> like that's kind of hard to come by now. I, it is. I mean, if you're, I guess if you all decide, Hey, we're going all in and going to start snowmobiling together. But even with that scenario, I do suggest you try to branch out and find somebody who's experienced just strictly from the safety aspect. Yeah. Whether it's it's avalanches or um, just etiquette, going down the trail, passing people, and making sure you're not going into oncoming little things that might be second nature to us or at this riding point. in dangerous terrain. Yeah, that you yeah. just have no clue what's above you. There's just, a, go ahead. No, there's just a host of stuff that an experienced rider, like riding with you, knowing like you know where to go under what conditions is yeah. like something I'll admit. Like I, I need to get better at the avi training and all that's one of my goals for either this year or next but riding with people that really do know it and understand it and learning and asking the questions so it's helped me a lot just to kind of assess the terrain that i'm in yeah. even if i'm not you know fully certified or anything like that but still kind of using some of that knowledge just to be aware of my surroundings yeah has helped with my comfort level in the backcountry and then I'm mean, I'm just digging deep. I'm thinking about every. I'm thinking of I were to get in the snowmobiling right now. Okay, this is kind of fun. The so many questions you walk into a dealership like gear, your average guy. I mean seriously, yeah. Like you were fortunate enough to know. So like like you interacted with me, and then obviously you started working here, and you learned everything the inside and out of the gear. Yeah, but. There's a lot of people that are getting into snowmobiling at 25, 30, whatever. And it's a blank slate. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I, With tons of options. Yeah. And tons of marketing coming at you hot. Yeah. I don't even know where I would start to be honest. I started thinking about our marketing campaigns and they make a lot of sense if you're already invested in the sport, mm -hmm. but I kind of feel the grassroots dealer level might be your, your best bet. Just a good rep or a good, I think, yeah, like running into your local dealer, you know, like for us here, all sports, I would say the closest dealer to the office. And, you know, it's like the guys behind the counter there, the guys that are working in that area or gals, uh, I mean, they know their stuff. Yeah. So if you go in asking the questions you, you know, want to ask, they're going to point you in a good direction, at least give you an array of options to look at. Yeah. And then, I mean, go home and research them. 
Like once you know what to look for, it's going to help inform your search quite a bit. You can go down so many YouTube rabbit holes. It's crazy. I, I've searched our gear and there's random dudes in like New Hampshire doing reviews on gear. And it's wild to think because we see it all come through here, gets a label slapped on it and goes on. But some guy's got a YouTube channel and he's diving into that. So, I mean, that and, you know, all these different publications, Snow West, et cetera. I mean, depending on your your region, we are specifically kind of chatting the mountainside. Um, I think the trail side would be a little easier to kind of get into almost. Just the the barrier to entry on the skill side. But mm-hmm. still, you'd kind of run into the same thing of just finding groups to get out with. Yeah. I would say, too, on the trail side, I mean, it. the nice thing is, is that I would say the barrier to entry is less because you yeah. can use some other insulated goods to get you by, you know, while you're hitting the trails. But when you are entering the back country, it is, you know, it becomes a lot more crucial to have gear that you're not only comfortable in, but it's something that if you were to get, you know, stranded out there, you know, something broke down, you know, worst case scenario is that gear's got your back. And that's why it's definitely important to, right. to look into that stuff. Yeah. All this stuff starts getting expensive too. Yep. But there's a pro to that. If you're getting a snowmobile lane at 30, hopefully you've, set aside some funds for this. You're looking for a hobby, whatever. You don't want to get a fishing boat. You don't want to do this. You don't want to do that. You're, this is the sport you want to try out. And there's like two ways to attack that. There's like the, the bare bones, the Craigslist 09 special, the clearance rack. And then there's the snow check, a brand new sled. You need the new truck maybe to get the sled there, the new gear, everything. So it is, there's not many sports where you can have, get into it for seven grand or get into it for a hundred grand. Yeah. Well, let's, let's unpack this. Let's like start at that, (laughs) that base level, like the, what you would probably end up paying, you know, at the absolute minimum to get into it. I want to hear what you, since you're still fairly new to it, what you would go out and buy if you were on a, let's just say. Well, when I started, I wasn't working for 509. So okay. like all yeah, the stuff yeah. was like, I had to go through all of that. Yeah. Um, what was your process of elimination there? So my process was, it was either I'm going to spend, you know, maybe it was seven, eight grand on a used sled on Craigslist. And then I start going on there and I'm looking and looking and I'm like, this one's got 2000 miles on it. Yeah. This one's got a new crate motor cause the other one blew up and then you're going down the thing and it's just confusing me further and further and further mysteries of what's been done to it. Yeah. (laughs) Oh yeah. Yeah. Like you could tell like this one had a turbo. They took this turbo off and you're like, I don't know what that does to reliability. I'm like starting to like get frantic. And then that's when, I mean, I, I ended up reaching out to somebody that knew what was what, which was you at the time. This is before we were like good buds and hanging out. But I was like, he's going to know. And he's, you know, Okay, he'll say maybe a new one or maybe, hey, look for this year of a used one, which you did. You're like, dude, if you don't want to go full pop for a new one, you're like, look for at least a 16 or newer axis, which is like, okay, you got at least the new chassis. Look for something with less than, you know, 1,500 miles on it, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and then the other is, you know, I looked for a last year's sled that somebody didn't pick up. Or they snow checked it and they didn't grab it, whatever the case was, but it was definitely discounted down. But you had a warranty too. Had a warranty, um, had the shop that backed you. So if anything did happen, there was somebody at least you could go to and and kind of voice your complaints or concerns with. Um, Luckily, new sleds nowadays are so dang reliable that, you know, outside of some minor recalls, things like that, it's like you can get on one, put easily 2,000 miles on it without having to do a top end, having to do anything really. Um, so that was like my process of elimination was, do I cry once, buy once, yeah. or do I look at something that can get me through this season? But then I might be looking at selling and getting into something new for the next. I think I think if, if you have the funds available and you're just getting into it is bite the bullet and buy a new one. Because there's a lot of pros that, well, A, it's brand new. It's the best technology. It's the most balanced chassis you'll have available. 
which in theory should be easier to learn on and figure everything out. B, you got a warranty. And C, if you hate it, sled values right now after a year, this current day and age right now, are like holding decent value. So I didn't, I by no means lost out when I sold that sled. Yeah. Like I got, I would, what I would consider as like what I lost on it was more than enough for how much fun I had on it for yeah. those two years. Yeah. It's, it's weird. I mean, I don't know how long that's going to last. <clears throat> that was a thing through a pandemic. Everything went up in value and including toys and anything in action sports or motorsports. Sorry. But if, if you have the means, I would, I would get something new. And, um, yeah, if you, like you said, if you hate it, it's, you're going to be out more on a used clapped out sled. If it's got 2000 yeah. miles on it, you ride it for another 500 miles that season. 20, once you hit like that 2000 plus in the first place, a 2,500 point, they are just dropping in value. Yeah. And all of a sudden you're getting rid of this thing that you just lost 3,500 bucks on <laughs> and you hated it. Yeah. And then I think the other thing too is, you know, obviously if you're going to a dealer and entrusting in the salesman that's selling you something, I mean, if you're getting not a good vibe from somebody, you should probably go somewhere else. Shop around. But uh, the main one too that I, like, I really appreciated at the time and I realized that it was 100% the right call was at the time I was looking at a 2020, I think chaos 155 and then it just a normal pro 163. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I'm sure the salesman would have made a little bit more if he would have sold me the chaos with all the bells and whistles. But knowing I was so fresh into it, he pointed me towards just the pro. Yeah. Which totally was the right call because I've been on chaoses now and they're, you know, you can chaotic. loop them out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're chaotic. And that would have made learning <laughs> significantly difficult. Yeah. And I think, like, for that, it was like, Okay, awesome. Like this guy could have steered me in the wrong direction. He didn't, and that might have been something I should have researched. But at the time I was I was stoked on that. You can form a lot of bad habits getting a sled that's too much for you in the formative years of of learning a new sport. Oh yeah. For sure. That opens the next can of worms. <laughs> if your budget doesn't matter, you're like, I'm going all in on this sport. Never done it. Maybe I rode once. I was out in Island Park. I was out in West Yellowstone, something. I got out and rode, or I rode my buddy's sled in a field, and I'm like, I want to do this. Do not. I see this too much. This is life advice. Do not go buy a factory turbo for your first snowmobile. I know about 10 people, and they're all professional athletes, that can ride a turbo to its full potential. <laughs> And yes, they're fun. There is a point when, you know, the weekend warrior can for sure have a turbo. Like you, you can handle it safely. Um, you still might not need or use all the power, but you can handle it. But I, now that they're an option, I see all these guys like, oh, you see, they got two stroke turbos now. I need a turbo. And I'm like, no, you don't. <laughs> I, all it's going to do is get you in the places you shouldn't be faster. Yeah. Like start on naturally aspirated. Not only get you there faster, but your skis won't be on the ground. Yeah. And you'll be heading towards that tree and not know what to do. Exactly. That. Yeah. It's, I don't know. I, I just travel a lot and I see a lot of totaled sleds come out and see a lot of total turbo sleds come out and you find out the story of what happened. And it was like on some fairly intermediate to beginner terrain and yeah. things went south on them. Yeah. I mean, if you're looking longevity too, it's like, yeah, you're not going to give your 16-year-old kid a Ferrari right. and expect concept. that he's going to learn or she's going to learn how to whip that thing. Or drive it know. responsibly. Yeah, <laughs> parallel park that. It's not happening. Yeah. And it's kind of the same thing with these factory turbos. Yeah, it's it actually surprised me. Anybody can just go buy them. But same thing. It's any sport. You can just, if you got the money, you can go buy a Bugatti or a Ferrari. Yeah. It doesn't really matter, but... Yeah, so just you, because you can doesn't mean you should. <laughs> 100%. Start on naturally aspirated. Get the fundamentals. All you're going to do is create bad habits. And then I just told Toby this the other day. So a little backstory. Toby used to be, um, we did all we do all these live events, and Toby would always be in the comments like first. And he became like this household name within the 509 <laughs> faculty here. It was like, and he guessed how long it's going to take Toby to chime in. And he'd be like 30 seconds in. 
And then he had the opportunity, his family actually moved down here and now he's like riding with us, which is, I can only imagine for him how wild that is. to uh, have been like number one fan 4,000 miles away in Alaska and now he's like right down the street. But he's that newest generation of sledders is getting to an age where they can get out in the mountain by themselves with their buddies. He's 16. And I, I mean, it's, it looks cool. They see it all the time and everybody, all these kids just want to learn hop overs and bow ties, but are skipping everything in between. Yeah. Like nothing against Toby. He's just young and it's new terrain. Like he's been hitting trees this year. I did that when I was 16, <laughs> but he's hitting trees and trying to learn re-entries. Yeah. Um, and I chatted with him this weekend. I was like, you'll spank all your friends and progress more if you can proficiently ride in the woods and focus on that for the next season, two seasons. And then everything else will come second nature once you get that balance point. Yeah. And you are a prime example of that in the latter, in the other opposite direction that you told me after like season two or was it season three for you? This is season three. That you want to start learning how to do that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, because now I can confidently get to riding areas, you know, and not feel like I'm going to get stuck here or stuck there. Yeah. Like I'm proficient from the truck to the zone. Yeah. And now I want to learn the fun stuff. Yeah, you you did a good job not, I mean, I kind of yelled at you too. You did mention you want to try one last year or something. and Oh, I tried it. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't work. <laughs> but, yeah, I just, there's so many different factors for getting into the sport and having a good time. Yeah. Like, so after the sled. So that's going to be yeah. your mode of shredding. After that, though, you're going to need the right gear mm -hmm. to feel good while you're out there. And that doesn't mean you have to buy the best of the best top dollar stuff unless you have the budget. And this is where an area where I would say if you do have the coin, that the top tier stuff is going to be the most dry, the you most get what you pay for. Exactly. Yeah. But I would say that there are, a bunch of different options when it comes to like your budget of the budget gear that's going to get you out and back yeah. ranging all the way to kind of that, the top tier ethers and things like that. Yeah. Like the Carhartt jacket and Carhartt bibs. <laughs> yeah. Just grown up Midwest. Shout I, out to you Midwest folks. Guys swore that they were warm by it, but I'd watch them try to stand up from their sled and they'd be in the shape of sitting still because everything was frozen solid. <laughs> and you could like see the seams cracking <laughs> with ice. And it, I mean, if it works, it works. But so, hey, funny thing though, another shout out to Michael. So, Ashley's husband. First time I rode with him, he's throwing his new mono suit on. And I'm like, look, and then I'm like, are those jeans? And he's like, yeah, what's wrong with that? And I was like, oh, buddy, like we're not trail riding. We're, you know, we're actually going to get in it. And we actually had like a stuck fest. Like yeah. it, we had no base. You stepped off the sled. You were like up to your chest. And then there was also logs, like maybe a foot under the snow. So it was kind of just like worst case scenario going on. The next time we rode, though. He had Merino base layers. Yeah. <laughs> base layers. I was guilty as that. I mean, when I first came from the Midwest, it was throw the jeans on all the time because you, you, you're you not getting in an early train. You're just going down the street to jump on the trail system and go for a cruise. You yeah. got your insulated pants on. You're not sweating your ass off. You're not working your body like you do out here. But, yeah, if, if you're getting into it and you're like, oh, I already got the mono, I got the gloves, I got the helmet, and they're like, why do I need to – I got a pair of sweatpants at home I can just wear. Purpose built base layers will change your whole day. And that is not a shameless sales plug for our base layers, but the reality of the technology that's in them, they yep. breathe, they wick moisture, they keep you warm when you're cold and they keep you cool when you're warm. Um, it's crazy technology. And I literally cringe when I see a <laughs> cotton sweatshirt hanging out of the back of a hood. Yeah. I mean, and it's so impressive too. And again, like you said, not just ours, but, across the industry it's it's impressive like wearing something like a merino base layer how much warmer you feel yeah. in colder temperatures with less on yeah and it's i mean especially when the wind starts going it's the ride back to the truck yeah that's when that kind of stuff gets crucial yeah man there's a lot of stuff that goes into getting the snowmobiling it is i mean there's a lot to do but it's once you do it i mean it's something 
you'll probably do for the rest of your time. The, the final kind of piece is getting to go riding, getting to location. Mm. And it's a little hard if you got a Camry and you're trying to buy a snowmobile, so it means you're going to have to buy a truck. Here's my evaluation of this. If you don't have the money, you just got to get some beater. Yeah. I'd continue saving because if you're in the West, the last place you want to be stranded in a truck is in the mountains. Mm-hmm. We're pretty remote, usually no cell service. Um, weather can change like that. So honestly, I really don't feel like it'd be a good choice to be in like a, a 97 Chevy. I, I mean, a lot of guys are, I'm going to offend somebody here, but <laughs> they'll get there. I it just, the reality of the safety side, the safety aspect coming to mind specifically Yeah, is it's doable for sure. You're just kind of rolling the dice every time you go out. I mean, it would just be managing your expectations. I mean, if you're, if that's what you can rip and that's what you can afford, like know that, you know, it'll probably be a lot more day trips, you know, hour away from the house as opposed to six, seven hours up to Revelstoke. And then if you do have a buddy with the newer truck and a sled deck or a trailer or something, for the love of God, offer him fuel money. <laughs> I've had those people in my life that are like, oh, well, you're going to drive today? Cool. And then... <laughs> And not even like a, a thought of like, can I help with anything? And I'm like, I'd probably say no, just because I want the person to have a good time. You know, yeah. they're getting into it. But just a little bit of respect goes a long way in keeping those sled buddies around. Pro tip. If you don't get a sled deck, you don't have to cart your buddy around. <laughs> and you get to drive by yourself and listen to your own music. Yes. Yeah. I do kind of like that some days. Yes. But there are days, obviously, when a sled deck's crucial and taking one rig up is is yeah. the play there's the other part of this trailer sled deck truck bed you're solo and you got a bunch of buddies um you just meet up with and you're fine with that truck bed is by far the most efficient cheapest method you buy a 200 hundred dollar ramp shove it in the back drive yourself to the parking lot meet up your buddies have a good time sled decks getting into it fairly advanced actually as far as skill sets go i mean and cost I yeah mean, those things are not cheap price point and then you know how many videos i've seen of people ending up on the roof and the hood <laughs> of their truck i guarantee those guys haven't been riding for 20 plus years yeah I, that actually that's a great point like you're not gonna throw one of those up there and not have ridden a sled before and feel confident backing that thing oh, out i get freaked out on i've probably gone up and down a sled deck two thousand times and <laughs> if my truck is slightly off camber because the second you hit that pivot point when you get up top of the ramp to the deck it just pitches the sled whatever way the truck's leaning. And I get terrified still. I have no shame saying, David, can you ride my sled? And I have, I have no judgment. I appreciate that rather than you doing something you're not comfortable with. And yeah. all of a sudden we're making an insurance claim on <laughs> two things. And the other thing to consider about a sled deck is that when summer rolls around, you got to have somewhere to either put it mm-hmm. or you're going to rock it all summer and then just know that if you can't get your dirt bike up on top of it, David, that we're going to make fun of you. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I got a new deck, longer ramp. It's a little more gradual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The dirt bike for me on a sled deck is like the novice snowmobiler <laughs> loading a sled deck. Totally. That's, that's where it falls into place for me. Totally. Because I'm equivalent to that with a bike. It was just that shoulder season, too, because you're still out in the mountains on the weekends. Dual sports but season. But then we're luckily able to... To yeah. rip some dirt bikes during the weekdays. Yeah. And then the big daddy of them all, um, an enclosed trailer. You don't have to have enclosed. Two place, whatever it may be, open place trailer works. But then the, obviously the the big the big boy is the enclosed trailer. Yep. Which is sick. I love I do admit I've been the guy that's super stoked when my buddy has a trailer and I have somewhere warm to change <laughs> totally. a bunch of space. Totally. I definitely will reap the benefits of that for a day. But um, depending on where you are, a lot of times you're limited in where you can go. Yeah, or not to mention, like, some of the trailheads aren't particularly maintained all that well. Yeah. Which can pose a pretty big issue if you're hauling a 25 30 foot trailer in yeah i've seen uh one of our local spots burke parking lot like oh yeah damn near a demo derby of trailers in there before i i've watched there alone guys like jackknife probably six times (laughs) 
<laughs> in like brand new 2020 Rams. It's off camber. It's icy. It's tight. Oh my gosh. And you just see these a trails West trailer and a Ram meet in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> it's not good. That and then um, another kind of factor to think about with trailers. They're not the best to pull when it, the weather gets bad. Yep. And you could go out and the day starts bluebird and then a system rolls in like that. And all of a sudden your drive home is five inches of snow on the highway and you're going 35 miles an hour because you got this 24 foot enclosed trailer behind you. Yeah. Meanwhile, your buddies with their sled deck or truck better at home already having, <laughs> having dinner. Yeah. No, definitely a, a slower moving project if you're, if you're rocking the trailer. But again, if you're, if you're looking at spending that much money and you're getting new into this sport, you know, then you really got to do your due diligence, yeah. making sure you can go to the trailhead everyone's going to. There's easy spots to turn around. Road conditions are good. Weather's good. Those are all things to consider. Yeah. So the final tally there, I'd say 97 Chev, say 20, let's go like a, even a pro. Okay. 2012 pro, some uh, clearance gear. You could be into the sport for, what, just say between 10 to 15? I would say that's doable. Yeah. If you got some some scheme and sense about you, yeah. that's doable. Yeah. And then the f- completely opposite side of that spectrum would be new diesel truck because you got your new enclosed trailer and your snow check sled and all your brand new gear. There's 150 grand you're, yeah. you're trailer lo- truck. You're looking at a... a Buck twenty five to a buck seventy five. Yeah, it gets expensive quick if you want to spend the dough. But with all that, I mean, it's all manageable depending on what you want to do. Obviously, where you're at in life, there's there's all these different variables, but there is options for whatever you have to work with to still get into it and find yeah. the right people to enjoy it with. Well, and you know what though, too, I'm gonna say this: you could do it for less. Yo, know, for sure. Because I'm just kind of doing an average. Well, speaking of Burke, we were out, I don't even know when it was. Uh, it was a very early season, but I was out there. We were riding back. We got stuck a lot. It was that same time we took Michael. And we were coming back in the dark because I was a bad tour guy and led him astray. But when we were coming back, we see these guys stopped on these. I mean, they had to have been like 90s sleds. You know, just like they were having a blast just tearing up the trail because it could, you know, yeah. barely make it up the trail with a little bit of fresh snow on it. But I would say this, that their fun ratio yeah. to money spent right. was probably substantially higher For sure. than ours. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I can see that too. I mean, if that's what you want to do, it, it, I'm s- more so if you want to get into like legitimate mountain riding. Yeah. But... Yeah, I mean, 90s XLTs, just a greasy triple and bombing around with your buddies, having lunch and a fire on the mountain, just yeah. riding logging roads. I, that's a, I mean, you got to get some buddies to commit to that because you can't do that by yourself. <laughs> no. That's the problem. You can't lift one of those by yourself. No, but yeah, that would be a blast also. Gosh, I had one thing I just thought about when we were saying that. I felt like I left out. Oh, something we overlooked that actually budget in mind if you don't want to dive off a deep end and fully invest in it is if you have a place near you like renting is actually a really solid to get out there because you get the insurance whatever yeah maybe it's 300 to 400 bucks a day but you go out for one season five six days i mean you're 2500 bucks give or take whatever versus 10 to 15 grand into it i'd rather be out 2,500 than 10 to 15 grand to figure out if this is a sport for me or not. Well, dude, funny thing is, is, uh, I was up in Leavenworth. This was kind of shortly after I'd oh, moved yeah, to I West. Oh yeah, I this story. Yeah, yeah, it was, a, it was a great one. Um, there with my lady and we we're just hanging out. I think we hiked up to a hot spring, totally not interested in snowmobiles at this point in my life. It was just never something that crossed my mind. I was living on the West side. So I was able to dirt bike year round. However, we're up there, you know, we get done, everything's cool. And I'm like seeing a snowmobile rental place across the street. And of course it was my birthday weekend, so I could make the calls. Impulse. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, we should do this. Granted, we had no snow gear at all. I had like a puffy jacket, some waterproof, like hiking pants, hiking shoes (laughs) and rented like 
the you know maybe the worst helmet physically possible. The, the whole f- the open face of the flip down shield was it by yes. chance? Nice. It was that, and it was fogged before I put it on my head. The West Yellowstone special, <laughs> <laughs> and it was I think two hundred and fifty bucks a day for. I think in total we spent 450 bucks because she got with some gear and everything included. with gear and everything. And even that they like, they just let us loose and we went and burned trail all day. I yeah. pretty much burnt an entire tank of fuel on this like old clapped 600, <laughs> but had the time of my life. And that pretty much then I got back, sparked it, moved over here and was like, okay, now it's time to really see, you know, what this whole snowmobile thing's about. Yeah. But that started it. Yeah. And that was a, you know, $450 investment in an awesome memory that I have. But on top of that, it started this whole new passion of mine. Yeah. I guess that raises a good point. Like, even though it was nothing close to a new mountain chassis or whatever, it was still deciding if you like grabbing the throttle, steering two skis and, yeah. and working a break. Yeah. And being on the snow. I mean, that, that can be whatever. That could be your gateway to, to dive into <laughs> more of it yeah funny story about that time though was so my lady she can shred a mountain bike she's awesome however she wasn't paying attention and rear-ended the crap out of me on that ride (laughs) like broke the snow flap off and everything and like hit it dented the rear bumper did you buy the insurance though they didn't know. Oh, that these things were so clapped that like they were just like, <laughs> looks good. I hope nobody <laughs> that works there listens to this podcast and searches in the system for your name. <laughs> I just get a claim in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> First slide they don't even have anymore. <laughs> but it was just like the whole experience was so much fun that like that started. And now she even rides yeah. to this day too. I mean that got her going. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. That was that was kind of fun. It was a bunch of different. I don't really know where we started, but. I couldn't tell you number one. I think something about dirt bikes and the transition and all that. Cause I, I could talk about that. How terrible the transition from snow to dirt let's, bikes is. Let's, let's flip the script. Okay. Give me, make it a 10 minute or <laughs> hit me. All right. So we're going to flip the script because you just got into dirt bikes. Mm-hmm. So the total opposite of me, which is why I think this friendship works so well is because, <laughs> you know, the skill level on both sides of the sport, it, it just works. So what was that transition like coming from the sled? I mean, being a very proficient snowmobiler to terrible, (laughs) absolutely horrible. You want to know why the number one reason Yeah, is a clutch (laughs) that that is the hardest part. You can get off of a dirt bike your whole life and get a snowmobile and be like, Oh, I don't have to work a clutch. This is just a CVT. Like it's just go. (laughs) The clutch is the hardest part. Yeah, it's handlebars. Yeah, there's a two-stroke motor and whatever. Yeah, I'm in the mountains, but, dude, the, I still battle in the clutch. And the other thing is the two points of contact. Yeah. Like, my brain and my balance is wired for being able to stop and my feet are still on running boards and I don't have to worry about tipping over. Or <laughs> If I'm going too slow, I don't just fall over. And I, I'm, what, year... Oh, like actually trying to learn how to ride a bike as far as like technical stuff. This will be summer four ish. Yeah. Like I spent a year just cruising single track with no like, like green runs. Right. Yeah. And then the last two summers for sure, the heaviest of trying to figure it out. So really year three of like really trying to figure it out. Yeah. Well, I know when we, when we started riding more, and I started dragging you into some of the, the fun stuff was when I started seeing, well, A, it was first that 150. Mm-hmm. And that thing, I just kept seeing you sending it without you on it. Yep. And then the gas still gas, I still saw that. <laughs> However, it was also on like progressively harder trails, harder trails, harder trails. Yeah. Um, and I would say like your, your skill turned around quick, you know, where you were no longer hanging us up as far as just like a crew riding. I mean, we loved it no matter what, even if you were hanging us up. But. Yeah. Well, I appreciate it, dude, but I still feel like I'm struggling big time. The, the one thing that's interesting to me on the dirt bike side is like, granted, I didn't really ask much for tips. Mm-hmm. Nobody really tells you anything. Like if they see, I, there's been, I, I could probably count one hand how many times somebody's like said, try this instead. Yeah. Which I don't know if that's just like a culture thing in the dirt bike world is like, 
you'll figure it out. Or if, if you don't <laughs> ask, we're not going to tell you. Yeah. I, I think there's like a, there's like a two part, like a, it's really hard to teach somebody on the trail yeah. how to double blip or zap something. Yeah, like, the sleds, we have this whole mountain available to us. Yeah. Like on that we're one, it's like one, one obstacle. Yeah. Hard to kind of like pinpoint like, okay, oh, hey, you got to drop your front end here while you're pulling the clutch in, build NARS to then drop it again right. to get compression to have that back up. It's like, no, Versus you're not doing a sled. I'm like, <laughs> I could just go around it. <laughs> yeah. So I think that that's like a, a part of it. The other one is just like the fun factor of watching a dude huck yeah. his bike up something without having to like then dig for an hour to get it out and stuff like that. But at the same time, like me personally, I do like to at least like if I'm seeing something and it's like body positioning, something easy that can be corrected right away. Like I definitely want the dude to like have that skill in his back pocket and I'll call it out when I see it. Not in a unsolicited way, but just, you know, if I know the guy good enough that I could give a pointer and it be taken the right way, then I will. Yeah, I I think now that I think about it more, the biggest, the toughest part for me coming from sledding to, to like single track hard enduro was not like sessioning something like the freedom is still awesome on a bike. Like we see some amazing stuff and we cover some awesome ground, but on a sled I'm wherever. And like, here's the playground is this zone is this whole face of this mountain yeah. and all these trees and all these obstacles versus you're confined to a straight line, which is why I think I've enjoyed I'm like, kind of feel like I'm doing the, I God, I'm evaluating myself now. I feel like I'm kind of doing like the hop over thing or skipping some steps almost because I'm enjoying the gnarly hard enduro because I'm in one spot for an extended amount of time yeah, and can like look at different line options, which takes me like to my sledding mindset. Yeah. Like, all right, this is still the trail, but there's 12 feet wide of options here totally. that I can slowly pick away at in first gear putzing <laughs> along and although it may be like a really advanced style of riding and difficult clutch control, all that throttle control, I don't know. I feel like that's why I enjoy the super slow stuff. Yeah. Well, the other thing too, God, like, I just learned that about myself right now. There you go. The other like, like crazy part is when you put it together and you look at like what we were saying about an act or like a chaos versus a pro. Yeah. And you want the right one at the right time. Like if you were on like a race SX bike, 250 yeah. F or yeah, 250 yeah, SX, like you wouldn't do what you're doing. Right. It's because you have the right bike. Yeah. That's why you're able to go a little bit further and manage it without it just, you know, completely not being on your side. Yeah. You just like slide. You don't need the biggest, baddest thing. You, you don't need to go out in the woods on a 450 like super cross bike. Yeah. Like not, not at all. Most pros actually try to get their bikes to the point where they're like the smoothest yeah. and actually the least like abrupt power. Right. So they can keep traction. Makes sense, but yeah, I don't know. I, I just like that slow pace stuff. Like when we do pack saddle, as grueling as it is, it yeah. takes me in the mindset of being in a nasty drainage on a sled yeah. and trying to find the line out. <laughs> and that's why I love when somebody in front of me like bobbles trying to pass them because I'm like thinking sleds, like we're all trying to get out the drainage totally. and who can take the best line. And I'm like not the one that stops and waits for him to – straighten his bike back up. I'm like <laughs> laughing and like getting high marking next to you on the bike. And I mean, dude, that's like that one. That's what makes it yeah. like, that's the fun stuff about hard enduro and just enduro in general. Like you're not just pounding laps on the track, which there's a time and place. And don't get me wrong. I did it for my entire life. Right. But it's like, there's also something to be said about being on the side of a mountain buddies passing you you know, you're flipping yeah. them off because they, you know, <laughs> chose a better line than you. But at the end of the day, it's like if someone's stuck, people come back. Exactly. They pull your fender. They, yeah. you know, help you out. It's, I mean, it's such a cool thing. But again, with that one, barrier to entry is, yeah. is there, but you can still get into it for a reasonable amount and, you know, be kitted out enough to do it yeah. and have a blast. It's damn clutches is the moral of the story. <laughs> Well, title of his podcast, <laughs> Damn, Damn Clutches. Clutches. <laughs> well, I hope you guys learned something here. I mean, we kind of rambled, but, uh, or you think we're like total 
assholes and super opinionated. I really, that wasn't the goal, (laughs) (laughs) but I I hope between Ty's perspective of getting into the sport and my perspective of being in it for most of my life, um, from sleds to bikes back and forth here, I hope you learned something and it makes you want to get into the sport and don't get, don't get discouraged. And like you said earlier, just find the right people to have in your corner and get out and enjoy it. Yeah. If you take one thing away from this, I would say just know that the sled community wants you to be a part of it. Even the best riders want to help the new riders get into the sport, feel comfortable, have a damn good time. Yeah. I mean, that's like our, that's what our company's built off. Of. Yeah. I'm feeling your passion. It says it right in the tagline. <laughs> Well, thanks for listening, guys. Um, oh, I'm going to give a quick plug because we kept mentioning Ashley. Um, our 509X Lab, which is here at headquarters, it's our experience center. Uh, you come in, learn the gear, learn all about the gear, get the right gear for you. If you are getting a sledding, this is actually a perfect segue. Um, we got pretty much one of everything there in stock to check out, try on. It is in Spokane Valley here at our headquarters. So if you're passing by an I-90 going somewhere, um, 2818. North Sullivan Road, Suite 110, Spokane Valley. Uh, there's an Instagram page, just 509 Lab. I think the hours are on there, but right now I think it's Tuesday through Fridays. Sounds right. Something like that from... like and Saturdays. Maybe Saturdays. Some Saturdays. From like 11 to 5.30 or noon to 5.30. I'm sorry, Ashley, if you listen to this and I got that all wrong. I know it's for sure till like 5.30, <laughs> <laughs> but... All right, guys. Well, thanks for listening to us. Um, if you're on YouTube, drop us a comment. Tell us tell us what you did when you got into sledding or into biking and what your go-to setup was. Um, also, let us know what you want to see in the future. If you're on Spotify or Apple, we appreciate the hell of all the five-star reviews. That helps us a ton push this for more people. And we will see you again in two weeks.